So that's around like 15k MRR, if I can do some quick math. Um, a little more than that. So MRR is 20. So welcome back to Indie Worldwide. Today we have with us Shar from Billflow. How is it going, Shar? Good. How are you? Doing well. Uh, you want to give us a one sentence or two sentence? What is Billflow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one sentence would be uh, the vision is to help uh, online businesses earn recurring revenue easier and faster with no code. Um, and if I tell you like how that came into play is is that billing and pricing is still a hard piece of every startup. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you've heard of OpenView Ventures. They do a lot in, in SaaS. And um, part of the research is showing that one of the biggest levers to grow as a startup is, is pricing. So updating your pricing model. Um, mm -hmm. can have the, it's the least amount of work for the most amount of return in, in, in terms of profit. And because of the complexities of, of billing, um, it's very hard for uh, startups to usually update their pricing, update their integrations. And, and our vision is- Do you have an example easier. of a, a kind of pricing change you've seen have a, a, an outsized effect? Yeah, I mean, I can use ourselves as an example. So one one of the- things we did ourselves was we updated our pricing at least like once every quarter um, based on the benchmark we had from the last quarter and um, you can really like for example like upping the prices of uh, we, we upped our prices once um, to tailor to the customers who were more serious about the product or who, who were at the stage who, who could use the product and pay for the product because the churn was higher on the lower tier customers. So upping the prices reduced the churn a bit, but also it, it, it decreased the conversion. So you could really play around with your entire onboarding flow and funnel by just tweaking your pricing model, uh, just changing the prices higher and lower. The other side is uh, what gets very difficult is actually changing your pricing model itself, not the actual amount of pricing. And if you dig into PLG movement, uh, product-led growth, PLG. Okay. it's pro product-led growth uh, it is a new term, uh, well, somewhat new term, a few years now, um, that your product basically works as a lever to grow your, your business. So you, most of your, instead of spending so much money on marketing, you're, you're spending your effort mostly to make the product so seamless for the users that the time to value is decreased as much as possible. Um, and in order to monetize perfectly for your business model, you have to understand like what the user does in your product and what metrics to actually monetize on. So as an early stage startup, all the way through your first like $10 million, you need to experiment enough to, to find that right model for, for your business and then tweak the, the actual pricing of it. So going from, let's say, per user pricing to revenue based pricing to um, any sort of like uh, anything that the user does within your application could be a pricing model change that's very difficult for a company to do. So maybe let's use stick on Billflow as an example. What is your current um, pricing model and how many customers are you serving? Yeah, so our pricing model is uh, a combination of flat and transaction per, per transaction um, volume. So if you're an early stage under 1 million uh, ARR, um, I think it's 75 bucks a month and 0.9% of the transactions um, every month. Um, as you grow, the transaction amount decreases and the flat increases. Um, that's so that uh, our users who are larger don't want to pay transaction amount. And, and the ones that are smaller don't have the... Um, budget to pay a larger uh, flat fee, which is why we build it the way we build it. Um, we currently have about 200 north of 220 um, SaaS companies who are using Billflow in production today um, and about 5,000 accounts, I think. Wow. So that's around like 15K MRR, if I can do some quick math. 
Um, a little more than that. So MRR is 20. Um, and if you add like annual contract value and, and so on, um, we're, we're closing around like 30, 30 plus at the moment. How big is the team? Um, team of five and five founders and a contractor actually. So mm -hmm. six people total. Oh, five co-founders and a contractor. Yeah. How is the like founder dynamics between the five of you? How, how do you manage that? Great question. Yeah. I mean, so everyone were friends from the day one when we started. Um, I, I actually knew every person um, either from school uh, years before or from some work that I did with them in, in, um, in the same industry. Uh, so the f first few years was kind of understanding each other better of how to, it's kind of like marriage <laughs> in some ways mm -hmm. this partnership you know understanding five way poly polyamorous <laughs> marriage. yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um but uh, you, you know i i think one of the best decisions i made was was to have like a large team of co-founders it, it, at some point when you uh when i learned all of the mistakes that like uh, when i made enough mistakes to mm -hmm. uh, kind of count myself as a, you know a, be able to do a startup next time and not make those mistakes uh, i i realized that um i wouldn't have been able to grow as much if i didn't have four other people who were as passionate about you know the vision and the product um, as if i did it by myself so that was a great learning. Like I, I think it, I, I exponentially uh, grew as a person because I had to balance my dynamics and balance how we do work with, you know, for other people. Yes, in the early days when you're not profitable yet, um, five co-founders might be too much and keeping that together is a very difficult thing. But once you become self-sustained and, and uh, you can actually handle the payroll, then you have five amazing uh, hires who already know everything about the business that they can help grow the business. So there's there's a so trade-off. Are you profitable there. right now? Are you, are you able to handle the payroll? Um, are you paying yourself? Yes. Um, the only person who's not getting paid is me, I think. Uh, yeah, the only person who's not getting paid is myself, uh, which is fine. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough in the previous careers that I saved enough for uh, running this business. Uh, so far and and everything goes back to the business so um we we are handling everyone else in the team so everybody's handled are you profitable after payroll whereas payroll basically 100 uh, percent yes yes but then we kind of anything left uh, usually on the quarterly basis we spend on any marketing or any necess necessary tools that we would need to pay for. Um, and I, I love paying annual uh, contracts for, for tools like, like Intercom. If I could pay for Google Cloud, I would have done that like on an annual basis. You get the cheaper discount and you kind of, uh, you already know yeah. if you're going to stick with the tool or not. So you have a lot of uh, like server costs for this business? No, actually our server costs are, I think around 2,500. Yeah, that's not terrible. No, um, especially not for managing five thousand accounts. Mm -hmm. That's like fifty cents an account, right? That's <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty cheap. Um, so five founders plus one, you're able to pay everybody except for yourself. Um, when did you start working on this? How long ago did you launch Billflow? Oh, good question. Um, four years ago, but what you see on the website and the product today is only two years old. So the first two years of it, we built another product um, with a, basically a different name, same vision, same same direction. Um, but after two years, we realized it didn't grow enough. We made a lot of mistakes building the platform. It was clunky. Um, so we scripted completely. We pivoted and like built the 5% of it that we knew people needed based on all of our conversations with customers, which we didn't have in the initial version. Um, so we launched what you see on the site September 2019. Uh, so it's been two years that we are actually at it with, with the current solution. How many customers did you bring from version one to the current? Almost nothing. Uh, version. Okay. Almost so nothing. Like, handful, like less than 10. Yeah. Um, how did you get from zero to about 5,000 accounts in the last two years? A lot of it has been inbound marketing. So one thing that did... 
let's see, three things that has done really well for us. 35% of our total traffic and uh, leads come from our Google content, like SEO content that we've written in our blogs nice. and did guest blogs and so on. Um, and the rest of it is split between partners. So no code partners and, and Stripe uh, partnership. So if you go into a Stripe partnership page, you could, you could choose us. To, that, that, that has done amazing as well. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nice um, landing pages on your website. Thank you. A lot of like integrations and things like that. So 35% from SEO. Where did you say the rest came from? Um, partnerships. So partnerships. whether like, partnerships and integrations, so you can split that, like uh, because of the nature of the product, like integrating with things like bubble, I'm not sure if, uh, mm -hmm. you, 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 yeah, the no code builder. Exactly. So what does exactly. an integration look like with them? Is it just look like it's a native bubble component? Do you maintain your branding? Mm -hmm. Um, tell me about those partnerships. Yeah. So bubble is actually very, um, different from the other ones because like uh, uh, Webflow and, and website builders, you can drag and drop like the code snippet and, and you have your billing pages. But for uh, Bubble allows you to actually build plugins. So uh, someone who's building their SaaS or MVP with Bubble, they could drag and drop like customer portal, checkout, pricing pages directly from their Bubble um, uh, builder in, into as a component. There are like th components for each of the billing pages that we have. Um, is that, that white works. labeled as a as a bubble component, or do they know that they're a billful customer? They, they have to install the plugin, so it is it is okay. uh, it has the billful thing, but you can take the branding off for your end customer if you're using it. So nice. So what kind of growth are you seeing right now, month over month? Um, it changes from one month over month, to be honest, and I I, I think I contribute that part of partly because. Billing is something companies look at at, at cycles, kind of mm. uh, pricing and billing. They, they there are cycles in, in a year that they they take a look at it. Um, usually, a good month could look like uh, thirty to fifty percent, um, and a bad month could look like as like ten percent ish. Um, and a year over a year, it's it's hard to say because it's only two years. It's it's been over a hundred percent, which which I hope that that you know first year was three hundred percent, second year is. Uh, 200%. So well, even if it stays at the worst case, like 10% month over month, you should be able to afford to pay yourself um, yeah. in a year. Exactly. Exactly. The, the point is, can we, there, there is a time in, in, in the life of the startup that the growth uh, needs to be high enough that would mm -hmm. be worth the time that you spend as a founder. Cause as a founder, you could be spending your time anywhere. Um, so that's always fully, the top of the mind. Are you fully bootstrapped right now? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, so I'm a big believer. From mm -hmm. Aforementioned previous success. Yeah. In Char's career. Um, solid. What is your plan to, to keep that growth engine running? So one thing is, is as I mentioned, PLG a few times, product-led growth. Um, mm -hmm. That's a market that we're going after. Um, which targets companies, SaaS companies particularly, who are mostly B2B SaaS companies around like a couple of million in ARR to like 20 million ARR. Those folks are the ones who can, um, who, who need us to save them the development resources on billing integrations and would be willing to pay anywhere from like 10,000 uh, per year up to like uh, 40, 50 per year annual contract value. So, uh, kind of, you can call it moving up market is the game at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Just just so bringing the revenue up and, and really being on par with the value we provide. I do want in the future to be us giving out the platform for free for early stage indie hackers, which that's a community. And, and that's why I kind of joined Indie Worldwide because I started... Um, you know, bootstrapping. And I, I really appreciate and respect every founder who, who builds their thing. And I want to contribute to uh, giving them the tools that could help them potentially. Uh, the hard part of that is is when you're early stage, you have to also keep up with the cost of support for, for those uh, lower accounts. That's not possible until you're, you're, you know, just profitable enough to be able to afford that. Oh, we're glad to have you at Indie World, right? That's for sure. Um, Maybe you could walk me through a hypothetical partnership. What are the, give me an example company you might target and how would you work with them? 
um, as a Billflow user or, or what exactly? For, the, for this like um, product-led growth strategy that you're pursuing. Uh, having a little yeah. trouble understanding what it looks like at the execution level. So product-led growth is more of a positioning than a partnership. Um, so it's same as same as saying that I would like to uh, target like no code in uh, movement and uh, the user segment that's in no code is like lower smaller startups who are just starting or bootstrapping. PLG mm-hmm. is just the positioning of a pro- uh, that that we're going after. That we're positioning ourselves as a no code tool that's built for a more enterprise level uh, SMB level company who, who which can scale for that uh, size of a business, basically. Gotcha. So you're going after those companies with like cold email outreach and like high touch sales. Um, LinkedIn is one that has worked well, um, but more importantly, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into providing value upfront. And I think the best way to do so is through content. So we're, we're building a lot of content right now for like pricing models and how to model your pricing, how pricing should be done in, in, in a growing business, value metric pricing uh, strategy for product-led growth. So your, your pricing, like I said in the beginning, should be based on the value you provide your user. Um, that, and, and to figure that out, there's the entire process that uh, you should adopt over time. Um, so what's the like three-year game plan for Billflow? I'll give you the five-year one that I know, um, and that is to, yeah. Um, there's so many places in, in, in a SaaS business that it, it, the, the, your end user interacts your, with your pricing and billing, and what we want to be is the um, obvious no-code tool that you just drag and drop any portion of your pricing model into your app, and um, it, it basically handles uh, your pricing metrics. So you could you could have a dashboard that says, these different pricing that you experimented over time um, have uh, performed, uh, you know, using this chart. So you, you could say like which pricing model actually worked out best for you, generated the most amount of revenue for you, um, and you double down on that. And, uh, do you have any goals around like um, revenue, or do you have like an exit strategy you're aiming towards? Yeah. Um, yes. So. Revenue is something that could, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because, um, yes, I, I still have the goal of hitting the 1 million. Uh, that's a big milestone. And I hope that we get there um, sometimes Q1, uh, 2 next year. Um, but having a revenue goal in mind could, could make us decide on feature sets or use cases or uh, path for a product that's not, really aligned with the end vision. So mm-hmm. I try to get away from just thinking about how fast I can I can grow this thing and more like what value can we provide users? What are the main problems in this market that we're serving that, that we could really uh, help solve? And, and, and the money is the byproduct of, of being successful at that. Um, all right, we've been talking to Shar from Billflow. Shar, do you have any closing words for us? Maybe some advice for an indie hacker just getting started? Um, no, just get started. I, I think the, the, the worst, uh, uh, the, the, the worst thing is, is, is that you just have to, uh, close it down and, and start another idea or, or get a job. So I think it's always great to experiment and failure is inevitable. So don't be scared. <laughs>